So uh, thank you guys for coming, first of all. Uh, my name is Taylor Jones. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, architecture and what's coming next, maybe. Uh, but we need to kind of view a couple of frames before we figure out exactly what is next. So uh, again, I said my name is Hi, uh, Taylor Jones. You can find me under, in, the, in the internet under Hi, I'm Taylor Jones. Uh, I grew up in this really weird state called Alabama. And uh, then I decided to move to an even stranger state called Florida. So I live smack dab in the middle of there in Orlando and love it. Uh, on the internet, I write stuff for uh, people like Codeship, uh, my personal site, Hi, I'm Taylor Jones. And I just write a bunch of stupid stuff on Twitter if you're interested in that too. Uh, this talk is not about Star Trek. So I, I apologize. Uh, I've got a few things in there, but we're not going to really talk about the whole history of the show or any of that kind of stuff, so yeah, uh, sorry. Anyways, uh, I work for IZEA uh, down in Orlando, and we do a lot of really, really interesting stuff. Uh, for one, we do content marketing. Uh, we also do a lot of social media, general data analytics, and provide enterprise solutions to uh, marketing systems. Uh, all that's to say that we just have a big pile of data and we're trying to organize it and f draw conclusions from it. Uh, honestly, we all have these kinds of data. For us, it's social media data. Uh, we depend on a lot of external APIs, uh, like Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, uh, any kind of popular social network out there. We're trying to mine metrics and data from it and provide that information uh, to folks who want to create content. So the, as far as the tools that we use, we use a lot of Rails and Ember.js. Uh, what that means is that our stack is very focused on this convention over configuration stuff, but we have a lot of Java and a good bit of Python in our stacks as well. Um, that being said, the balance of our stack is always changing. Uh, we're always trying to look at something new. I think DHH had a wonderful analogy the other day when he was talking about how we kind of drive, but we also swerve over every once in a while and try to figure out what's, what's new and, and why it matters. Uh, this talk is mostly about Rails architecture, uh, where it's been and where it's going. We're also talking about technical debt and how architecture can create or relieve it. Um, Isaiah has technical debt. Uh, your company also has technical debt, and we have to figure out how to address it. I believe architecture is the root of a lot of our technical debt. And this seems like a loaded statement or acting like, you know, architecture is the problem, but it's what I mostly mean is that it's, it determines the means that our technical debt is piled up and grows. So how exactly does architecture create technical debt? Uh, we often come so focused on building features that we forget to clean up our mess. And uh, fixing technical debt is also viewed as just not profitable. I mean, you st our stock's not gonna go up overnight because we said we're uh, addressing technical debt. People wanna see feature shift. They wanna see exciting things. They wanna see uh, whatever's new and hot. But have things always been this way? Uh, does modern architecture create more debt? Have we just like forgotten something from the old days? And did we lose some sort of insight along the way and stop caring about it? So I think it's important to look back at the past uh, and see if we can find something within there. Uh, what was early web development like? Well, applications were really hard to deploy. Uh, code organization was inconsistent. And development was license driven. Environments are also really hard to duplicate, and, and these problems still exist. Uh, none of these things are completely solved, but if you look at five, ten years ago, they were probably twice as hard as they were today in a lot of instances. So uh, then in this era of the web, uh, this thing called Rails appeared, and it was really interesting because it employed this idea of convention over configuration. Uh, and it, what that simply means is that it, it eliminates the tedious parts of development, like setting up an environment and scaffolding stuff, and it allows developers to really focus on the things that matter. This really is an, a, an important thing for, especially for products that are trying to quickly iterate, trying to quickly develop, trying to develop new features and get stuff out the door. It, it, in short, it eliminates a lot of yak shaving in the world. Uh, Rails took the web development process and refactored it, in my opinion. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, the refactor that it was was automatically good, right? We can do good refactors, but we can also make really bad refactors in our minds. So what kind of refactor do we think Rails is? Well, this is a picture of my cat, so, um, but 
We do want to look at how Rails has evolved to kind of understand this, because I think there's some really important patterns if you look at just the overarching picture of how the framework has evolved. So if you look at the origin of Rails, we see that it's based on an existing product, right? It's based off the extraction of Basecamp. It has a real world use case by default, right? So DHS could have extracted Rails and gone home and said, you know what, I did it, I, I put something out there and that's good enough for me because it works and it's a product and we're making money off of it. But what really helped it find its place is making that an open source project and opening the commit rights to it and allowing it to grow and, and for other people to see if it resonated with them. Well, it did. Uh, until probably it started growing a little bit, and uh, some folks decided to create a uh, framework known as MERB. Uh, MERB was a reaction to a lot of the problems in Rails, right? It's from the Ruby community built this framework, and it was uh, like the idea of a cleaner implementation, whereas the original Rails was an extraction of a product and some, an idea. Uh, MERB was saying, what if we took these ideas that really resonated with us, and we wrote it, from a clean, from scratch, from the start, without any of the uh, kind of mistakes that we saw maybe being made along the way. And so it focused on speed, scalability, modularity, and API tools. So uh, eventually, Merv and Rails decided to merge together. Uh, this resulted in Rails 3.0. Uh, it was a little bit messy, uh, to say the least. But I think it was ultimately good for the Ruby community and the Rails community and the Merv community because it, it united them over uh, a common framework or community, because ultimately I think that that's what's one of Rails' strongest attributes, is a really good community that cares. Uh, but as a result, some ideas that were presented in both frameworks, right, didn't survive because they were very binary decisions. Uh, how to handle maybe certain parts of what was now active record, right? So post-merger Rails uh, began to take some of the lessons that maybe it learned from the kind of having the MERB having to be created in general, right? Like the fact that we felt like, okay, we're frustrated with the problems with Rails, so we're gonna do our own thing. Uh, and started to implement some of these ideas. So uh, one of the things I think is really interesting in Rails 4, uh, breaking apart the general active libraries and putting them to their own gems, right? So when you bump to new Rails versions, a lot of times you're just bumping those gems, which is really cool. Uh, and then Rails 5 introduced API mode, uh, which is always possible with Rails, but it just made it a little bit simpler, right? So after time, Architecture begins to become slow and messy and a pain to maintain. Uh, what this means is that uh, we have to recognize code smells, bad patterns, and other harmful things. Uh, this isn't easy at all for us to do, right? Like it's not, you never develop something and think, man, I'm really shipping some awful code and destroying the structure of my application as I know it. It's not until we get down the road that you look and you're like, ah, oh, that wasn't a good idea, you know? So. Uh, a couple years ago, I, I was doing research for this. I, this is my first Rails conference, actually, but I've been kind of long-time listener, first-time caller in a lot of ways. And I saw that uh, Robert Martin, who I really admire, uh, keynoted a long time ago. And one of his keynote in 2010 was about the, the issues that Smalltalk dealt with and what ultimately kind of crushed that community at large. And so the thing that he found was that what, one, of the, one of the many attributes that kind of led to the demise of the small talk community that was really easy to make a mess. This is really true for a lot of things, but I think with a language like Ruby and a framework like Rails, we do have to be cognizant of making a mess because a lot of times it can result in some really big performance bottlenecks. Uh, so what, how can we make a mess in Rails? Uh, if you haven't made a mess in Rails, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a great learning experience, but uh, some examples might be a lack of distribution between model views and controllers. Some people might say models are too fat or controllers are too big or uh, maybe you're doing some crazy stuff on the view layer and uh, there's a misunderstanding of Rails queries, maybe hitting the database too many times. Maybe not understanding what you're doing with Ruby, right? Because Ruby is magic and uh, a lot of times you don't realize that Ruby can be really slow if you don't use it right. And uh, misunderstanding uh, just common code smells and just, you know, and those things are not unique to Ruby, uh, but they nonetheless plague the community. So as Rails grew, it began to address a lot of the issues that plagued the community the most. Uh, this involved making the framework more modular, efficient, and scalable, right? That's ultimately what I think has led to the success while we have this conference in general is because the community has been able to say, you know what, like this is a problem that we're really frustrated with, let's address it. Let's uh, move forward, work together, find the best solution to move into the future. But despite this, as Rails is useful as it used to be, right? 
it used to be uh, the most, like, a really, really popular all-in-one solution, but, uh, you know, the internet's weird, and people write blogs about how it's dead, and how it's stupid, and how we're all idiots for being here, but, like, is it as relevant either? Uh, is Rails just done for? And we're here, and <laughs> I think that's, that's kind of the answer to that, but, like, it, you know, should we just all go home and move to something else? But I do want to talk about an interesting story that happened with Twitter. Uh, and their choice to to move away from Rails. Uh, this is a little bit of a it's kind of a hard lesson learned when I'm looking back at the history of Rails. So, uh, Twitter suddenly became a big deal overnight. A lot of people started using it, and it became also the poster child of Ruby on Rails in a lot of ways because people started using it really early on, right? Um, but eventually, uh, they started to move away from Rails, and there was kind of the rumors on the internet, you know, TechCrunch was writing articles, and like, oh my gosh, they're moving away from this, it's so crazy. Uh, but why did they actually do it, right? It's just a lot of speculation, but what's the truth? And so, from what I could gather, it came to the idea of when they looked at reinventing search. And when Twitter was rewriting their search engine, they found that they had a lot of frustration with Rails, and this had to do a lot with how they handled data, how they um, queued it up and how they called it from the database. So they're able to make some slight changes on their SQL layer or database layer and maybe move some things around, but they ultimately just found that writing in other languages was better for them. Uh, so they started to gradually dismantle their Rails stuff and move to something new. So in short, they were breaking down something bigger into some unique services that work together. Sounds really, really familiar if you've studied architecture at all. And that comes down to microservices. And it is totally the hype train in the dev community right now. And uh, we're going to have to talk about it because everybody wants to talk about it. And um, so how have microservices actually benefited companies, though, right? They just say, oh, man, we switched to microservices. Our lives are so much better. Like, well, how? Uh, what's the big deal with it? So I, I think a great example, actually, is Netflix. Uh, now, Netflix does not really use that much Rails. But uh, they took a, they were a really big success story, an advocate for microservices. So they have really great architecture, in my opinion. If you, if you subscribe to Netflix at all, or you um, see what they do, you can find that like, it, they are really good at delivering high quality HD content to you, wherever in the world you are. Uh, so it, they have the advantage of using uh, whatever language they want to for these smaller services. And they took early bet on it, right? But as their service grew, they were able to really scale it to, to fit the demand in the world. So the question comes, though, how do you actually test all this stuff you're building, right? Because you're building these isolated pieces. Um, so this comes down to Netflix's Simeon Army, or the testing standards that they created to exercise some aspects of their microservices. Uh, the Simeon Army created a, a high stakes for the developers as well. So from what I've been researching and understanding about it, they basically have things that will take down production instances of their application if they're not up to standard. Uh, this is pretty crazy because I don't know about you, but I would hate to get a call that I totally am uh, hosing part of Netflix's infrastructure because of something, a typo I made or something weird. But uh, they've created this standard that allows them to uh, be able to deliver content despite those uh, downages or despite those hindrances, which I think is super cool. Uh, the whole takeaway from this is saying that when we change our architectures, our process and our understanding has to change, meaning that uh, we, we trade the comfort of what we understand, right? So for me, this is, that may be a monolith or it might be something else. And we try to say, you know what, microservices or whatever it might be looks a lot happier. It looks like a better life. So I think we should go for it. Um, but every architecture is a brave new world in many ways. It's, it's, it can be dangerous, it can be dicey. Uh, if we do it wrong, we could seriously hurt our businesses, uh, lose a lot of developers, and really just have a horrible time with it. Uh, so how do success stories though, right? With Netflix or maybe Twitter finding success and moving to something different. How does that work for Rails? Um, so I wanna talk about what it means to actually design uh, certain patterns in Rails. Uh, so, for one, we have monolithic design. And monolithic design, if you don't know, if you haven't ever reasoned it out or looked into it, it just, it's basically this. You have these connected pieces, uh, all within some encompassing environment, and they can share data with each other. They have pretty good knowledge of what each other does, right? If you think about Rails, Rails has a, you could technically call stuff from the view layer and, and, and understand the controller and make database pings and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, they all, it, it, the cool part about Rails, right, is that you're able to pass data incredibly easy. You don't have to write an interface or anything like that to, um, to properly scaffold and, and get data going throughout your application. So the deal with monoliths for Rails is I think it's always skewed historically towards that tendency. And that's been a really good strength of it. Uh, especially when we talk about, remember the history of early on where everything was really hard to configure, uh, you know, everything was license driven, e environments are a, a pain to set up and import across. Um, but it has been a su subject of a lot of hate mail, right? Uh, especially in the modern day because everybody's saying, well, I use a monolith and it's awesome and I think my research is stupid. And the people in my research say, well, I think you're really stupid and I'm going to write a medium post about it. But like, it, you know, there, so one of those kind of big pieces that ruffle a few feathers, DHH wrote something called the Majestic Monolith. And it's basically saying like, hey, you know, Basecamp does this, we really like it a lot. Uh, we don't think that Microsoft's people are chumps, but like don't come at us when we say we use a monolith. And that was it, but you know, it turned into a whole like firestorm for a few days and people got mad and said everybody was an idiot and it was stupid. But um, the point of monoliths though is that they're rooted in uniformity. And they're also rooted in very tight coupling. So Isaiah um, had monolith architecture to start off with, like maybe a lot of apps. Um, what this means for us is that we learned the hard way uh, of how to process a lot of our data. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of data incoming and, and a growing amount of it, right? With every user that connects to our service or um, every business thing that we do, we, we're tracking these metrics and analyzing them, seeing how well a lot of our content does. And, we uh, realize a greater need for uh, processing all this data, right? And uh, you can use great tools like Sidekick, and uh, we certainly do and love it, and, and they're great solutions for dealing with that kind of stuff. But we said, you know, what, what would happen if we started dabbling in some AWS, right? What if we started maybe writing a few lambdas and trying that? And so soon enough, we found ourselves kind of going this weird journey where we're heading towards microservices all of a sudden. Uh, and this is kind of where my, the whole idea came into my head and what I've experienced and kind of been able to watch that uh, the past couple of, uh, past year or so. So if we remember our monolith, uh, microservices are kind of like this in a simplified way. They're very independent pieces uh, that uh, are a little bit cleaner looking. Uh, they're naturally, they're naturally more aesthetic to the eye. You're like, of course I'd want the neat things as opposed to the big blob that looks like a, some kind of amoeba or something like that. And, you know, like, I, I think a lot of uh, folks kind of wonder how Rails fits in that microservice ecosystem. So I think the most popular usage for Rails is with the API. Um, I think that there are a lot of ways that you can use other aspects of Rails, but if we're talking about, like, if you tell me, hey, you know what, I want to do microservices with Rails right now, I say, like, build API on Rails. It's going to be, a, it's a great tool to do so. Um, so how we handle that uh, is we use our, still our big uh, monolith-like Rails app, and we uh, make calls to AWS and little services that we build, or uh, any other kind of service we might build. We could go roll something up completely in Java. We don't have to uh, write a Lambda to do everything or anything like that. So the advantage is we can have developers that are focused on looking at uh, maybe some more intense data problems. We've hired a couple of data science folks, a couple of uh, analytics uh, developers, and they've been really instrumental in helping us process and queue up all this data that we have. So um, I, I think some tips, though, uh, if you're gonna do it, Use a stable language when you're taking a big bet on something, right? Uh, for example, I love Rust. I think it's a great language, but I would not write my entire metric service in Rust right now. Uh, I think what uh, Yehuda and uh, Godfrey and all the, all the folks at Skylight are doing uh, with Helix, meaning that they can run Rust at a lower level on their Ruby stuff, is a really great example because they're able to take a risk on a, on a newer language that's really proven to be awesome but they're able to take a small risk and capitalize upon that if they see success and return, right? So if they, if they found that that Helix didn't work, they would just go back to what they were doing before, as opposed to putting their business out on a limb because they want to try something new. And so uh, luckily there's not any disaster stories to tell from those kind of stuff, but uh, I feel like it's important to put that out there. Uh, so microservices are rooted in modularity, and they're also rooted in loose coupling. Uh, 
So when we have, we, we compare the ideas of microservices and monoliths, and they seem pretty, they seem pretty night and day, right? Um, but the more I've kind of researched it and looked at our stuff and looked at other people's stuff, I've kind of figured out a lot of people live in between these two ideas, right? Uh, like us, we have a big Rails app, but we also utilize microservices, and we're heading towards that journey, and we feel like we're gonna make it to eventually just having equal pieces, but even all your microservices probably aren't gonna be the same size, right? So uh, there's this idea of microservice ecosystems that looks like this. So we got our monolith, we have our microservices, and this is what I think a microservice ecosystem looks like. And you might be, Taylor, you just add a square behind it. You're not a, this, this is stupid, like, you know, but, it, it, the point I'm tr I see with it is that we're able, we have very neat pieces, but they're all controlled by some kind of uh, higher being in a way. And uh, these ecosystems rooted in modularity, right? They have replaceable pieces, um, but they are also a little bit tighter coupled, um, meaning that they have a bit more knowledge of each other than maybe the standard microservice might have, right? So if you, when you write a microservice, you have to write an interface to understand that kind of stuff. Um, the point I'm getting at is that most of our stuff exists within the space where we have smaller services, but they have a lot, of, lot more knowledge almost and they need to know uh, about other services. And I, the more I thought about it, I think Docker was a great example. So with Docker, you can create these small containers, right? You can put your database in, in Docker, you can put your Rails app in Docker, you can put your other front end services in Docker. Uh, but then you're going to end up using a tool like Compose, for example, to control and to, uh, to really organize all these pieces. And so Compose is the thing that has the knowledge of all that, these, these smaller units. Um, Amazon Web Services is also a great example where you, you can choose a variety of Amazon services and pay them an infinite amount of money to use them all. Uh, but they're, the beauty of AWS to me and what I found that we love at Isaiah is that we're able to uh, properly uh, just use whatever you want and it, it really works for what we have and it kind of automatically configures and scales itself depending on what we use. But more so the point that I saw even from the vanilla use case is that Rails is very much this kind of thing. Um, in many ways I believe Rails is a microservice ecosystem and that might be controversial. Um, sorry. Uh, you know this might be controversial but I think that uh, we, we have these small modular pieces, right? We've, we've been working towards making parts of the Rails ecosystem independent so that we can easily replace that with. So we, we, can, we can choose what kind of server we want in Rails. So you can, oftentimes you can insert React or Ember or Angular, all these things into our services. And so we have this a bit tighter coupling as a consequence of that, but we're able to use Rails and customize it to our, to our means. So we can really pare it up and pare it down. And I think that's a result of a lot of uh, the development that we've seen in the Rails history of things. So you might say, okay, I, I see what you you mean, like this is great, like I, I get that we're a microservice ecosystem and you know, we used to be monoliths and everyone's to be microservice. Well, I, I wanna do it, man, I don't care what you have to say, like just tell me how to do it. And uh, after all, one architecture does not fit all Rails apps. And I think that was the point of a lot of the discourse that goes on in the internet where we yell at each other about whether who's better. Um, so let's say you want out. How do you get out? Uh, this, is, this is the part I want to talk about uh, how we switch architecture without crushing our hopes and dreams. And uh, I think the first step that you have to do when you look at switching to something new is you have to kill the hype. Uh, forget about your love for Rails, forget about your love uh, or, or, or hate for Java or anything else out there. You have to, if you're gonna evaluate what you're paring down or what you're switching to, you have to understand that um, your history sometimes doesn't matter in that sense, or your, your love or hate. So, um, the important notes, uh, there's a difference between implementing something in a project that's smaller and putting it in production code. Uh, please realize that was kind of a note I said on like Rust and other languages earlier, that we don't want to take really big risk because that's a bad idea. Um, but I, I think it's important to uh, be excited by new things, but also be skeptical. Um, you have to reset your bias on things. Things have changed in the development world, um, but also what you're doing is working just fine. Uh, every method uh, has, a, has a balance or, or, or kind of zen for each group of people, and 
you have to think about what type of architecture also supports your team's size and skill sets. If you're a small startup with like three developers, don't necessarily go after building 20 microservices, right, in like different languages, because that's gonna be really hard to maintain. Um, I think secondly, it's important to find your pacing. And uh, what I've seen is that we talk a lot about DevOps. We say that, oh man, we're gonna go to the DevOps conference, we've hired a DevOps developer, we're all DevOps crazy over here at DevOps Incorporated, but it, it, you have to realize that when you change your architecture, your deployment process, your development process, your scrum process, whatever you have, is completely getting reset for the new context you're going after. And uh, that's what we've realized at IZ is that we, you know, we want to, we have a lot of developers doing different things, but we have to realize that the balance of our developers and, and, and what languages they specialize in has to coordinate uh, with uh, the, the ability and their knowledge of deploying. We have to go from having just like, okay, here DevOps guy, deploy the code, we're gonna keep developing, to training developers to have responsibility of the code they write. So. Uh, finally, I believe that knowledge is power. And uh, this is where I kind of going to veer into this whole idea that we're not all on the same page in programming. Uh, that's always been that way. Even when programmers were some high class like people that were all went to college and had master's degrees and that could out science and out math everybody in the world. Um, we often only let people that we consider professional discuss design and improve architecture. It's almost like this kind of very holy ritual that we have. And, um, but what happens when these people retire and move on? We don't want to focus and front load all our knowledge uh, or all our architecture thoughts or anything like that in the hands of a few people. Um, we want to train the next generation of developers to really learn how to design well. Um, so I think it's important to realize that we all come from different places and backgrounds. Um, this, it's been, I've loved this conference because I've met more coding boot camp people than I ever have. I work with a lot of them at IZEA, and it's a great blessing. Um, but it's really cool to see one that folks that are either teaching themselves or taking initiative to do these boot camps are coming and say like, I'm not only learning this stuff, I'm wanting to get involved. Um, I think it's important to embrace your history and implement in your work. Uh, never feel ashamed because of what you do or where you're from. Don't, don't ever let anybody think and tell you that because you didn't go to college, you didn't do whatever, that you're not uh, a good developer, that you don't know anything. Because the reality is I did the whole college thing. I did the kind of higher level education. And I learned a lot, and I loved it. It was great. But I, I do think that I love hearing the perspective of people who are self-taught or went to boot camps because oftentimes they're seeing stuff that I don't see. And I think that's awesome. So how do you kind of help share that knowledge in a team environment? And I, I think that uh, I came up with kind of six steps that I saw that would be a really good start for trying to figure out how to design with a team and to share that knowledge. Uh, one being that you, you, you don't want to have too many ki cooks in the kitchen, right? You don't want to have a design by committee necessarily, but you want to say, hey, let's get like kind of three of our top developers together and let's kind of butt heads and see if we can come up with this design. Uh, then you're going to bring this proposed design uh, to a small but diverse team, meaning uh, diverse in experience and backgrounds. Uh, so you want to kind of hear from all levels, try to workshop it as diversely as possible. Take that feedback, go back with your core team design, uh, and then uh, bring that whole design to your engineering team. Let them see that and learn from it. Whether they want to or care about it or not, it's not your problem. Just put it in front of them. Uh, try to get some feedback. Workshop it maybe once more, and then bring it back and say, hey guys, this is what we're doing. Uh, we've all agreed on this, but we made some executive decisions because we are, we are in a place where, where we're supposed to be because of a reason, and you know, this is what we're doing. So uh, this is a little chart of how that might work, right? You have a small core team, you got the little workshop team, and you got the whole engineering team, just to visualize that. Um, few kind of thought leadery devices, or like, absolute things here, right? Effective software teams teach each other, in my opinion. Effective software developers have the desire to learn. Uh, you don't always have these two syncing up with each other, right? I've been part of, a, of companies that have a lot of guys or girls that can teach well, but they can't, nobody wants to learn. Or maybe have a lot of people that want to learn, but nobody wants to teach. Everyone wants to kind of um, just really shut them out. and. Uh, I think there's some, been some great talks this weekend on that sort of subjects, and I refer to other people. I think Marco's keynote this morning was awesome, and uh, a variety of other folks have spoken about some really great stuff as far as how do we sync on the same page, or what can we do. Um, 
this disconnect is creating developers a lot of times uh, who are comfortable with being in their own environments. And what I mean by that is that we have a lot of folks that are uh, really good at being working at company X, but aren't necessarily gr concerned about growing. And I think it's really important that we look at ways that we can uh, help teach people and help them grow and not be worried about what that means for us or if they leave us or they go to some bigger place. Like, we should be uh, focused on making good software and teaching people and loving people well. Uh, so here we're going to go into the kind of wrap-up and maybe try to stream together a lot of things that we've done here. Um, architecture, in many ways, is a house. Um, debt piles up in different places. Uh, a good example, I think, of this is Spaceship Earth. I, I'm, I love going to Disney. I think it's awesome. Uh, Spaceship Earth, if you've never been on it, it's just a big old globe. It has a ride. It goes all the way up through it. It's super cool. Uh, the problem is, is that it's, it, it's a unique thing. It's its own piece of architecture. Uh, and there's another building at Disney. And if we compare the two, right? Um, we look at this and we say, okay, maybe like dust and clutter and all the yucky stuff that we want to clean is going to collect differently in this place than it's going to collect in uh, this place right here. Um, and that's okay. Uh, architecture can sometimes be an escape hatch for us <laughs> to escape debt. And Twitter's example, that's why I brought it up, we saw that they said, you know what, we've kind of painted ourselves into a corner because we have this big user growth and we have all this, these problems and we're trying to rewrite search and make it better. But ultimately, it's just easier for us to ditch Rails and switch to something else. Uh, ultimately, we need to learn how to clean our house and, uh, without, and maintain our house. Moving is expensive. It doesn't mean that you should ever not move. It doesn't mean that uh, you should always fight the battle and, and go down swinging. You know, like you, you need to learn how to clean up after yourselves, guys and girls. Like it's important to learn how to confront technical debt. Um, find a place in your process that allows for addressing debt while pushing forward features. You're never going to have a time to stop development completely and work on uh, technical debt. I'm, I'm sorry to break it to you. I, I'm, sl I'm slowly coming to realities with that, uh, or to grips with that reality, <laughs> but uh, we have to find a way to do this in, in the way that we deliver features. It might take longer, uh, but ultimately it's going to mean that you're delivering cleaner and better features to your customers. Uh, I've really loved it when I have written stuff and I've been cognizant of the mess I'm making. Uh, in the very few times it happens. And, you know, being proud of that because, one, I saw the problem, but two, I'm not getting uh, yelled at, you know, a couple weeks down the line because something blew up and a person's really mad. So uh, it, it's a really great incentive for me to write good, clean code. Um, architecture should feel comfortable. Uh, ultimately, it, it's after developer happiness. People are, should not switch to microservices because they want to be cool. Or they shouldn't feel like they can't switch because they don't, want to follow a trend, they should be after what makes them happy and what makes you uh, feel effective as a developer. This is really prevalent in the Ruby community, right? Uh, the idea of Ruby is bent on developer happiness. Rails is bent on developer happiness. It's, it, it, we're, it's, it's there and we're using these tools because we feel like they help us not only become better software developers or writers or anything like that, but because they make us happy and they make work feel less like work, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, so what's coming for us next, right? We're talking about the next generation. We say, okay, we, we've rolled through the past and rolled through the present. We've kind of talked about the current debate that's raging on, but what's going to be next? I don't have a, the slightest idea. Um, so I'm sorry if you came to this talk and you wanted to answer. I, I don't know what's coming next. I can't predict the future. But what I can say is that we look at these small pieces of history, right, within the history of Rails, uh, with the history of architecture, we've kind of seen this back and forth between monolith and microservices, and we're seeing the pendulum swing over to more modular microservice-like code. Uh, that's not to say that things, uh, you know, won't become more monolithic or anything like that. Um, maybe there's this idea of WebAssembly coming along that is going to completely ruin our jobs and make us all code C++ in the browser again. Like, I don't know. Uh, and that's okay, because I really like being a developer right now. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm really excited to learn about the past and how we got there and being thankful that I'm not having to do a lot of stuff that people used to do or, or solve problems that people have already solved. But um, I, I want to be excited about the future. And, and maybe we're going to be writing blog posts to each other about how we don't use servers anymore and we're amazing and you suck, you know? I, I don't know. Uh, but that's okay. 
uh, I think we're ready for whatever's next. Uh, so that's my talk. Uh, thank you guys for coming along. Uh, got about five minutes for questions, if they amounts to talk. If not, we can talk later, but yeah. Like how, to, so you're saying like, how do I clean up technical debt while working on features? Well, uh, I think that's kind of hard, right? Uh, and it comes down to changing the environment at where you work. Uh, so whether you work in a company or where you work by yourself as a consultant, um, a good example, I think, of that, whether you might roll your eyes or not about it, is, is TDD. Uh, so we look at TDD and we say we write tests, we write code, and then we refactor. That's an important pillar of TDD that I think it's ever looked. And so I think that the cleaning up the technical debt should come up in the refactor part, honestly. Um, with TDD, uh, not everybody uses TDD and everybody's got a hot opinion about it, but whatever your TDD is, um, I think it's important. It, I think it requires having a structured process, uh, mainly that you're looking and you're saying, all right, we're designing code, we're writing code, and then we're cleaning up code. And whether that means that like, if you're doing pretty well in technical debt and you say, okay, well, you know, we'll only take maybe uh, you know, two hours out of every cycle to clean up stuff. Uh, but maybe when you're saying like, okay, our, your Twitter and your application is scaled beyond growth and everything seems like a garbage fire, like you might say, okay, we're going to try to just fight this as much as we can and expand our time. So um, yeah, realizing from a leadership level that like, hey, uh, we need to do this and that kind of sucks, right? Because we can't, some of us aren't leaders or some of us don't have the ability to change culture and it's kind of like, ugh. But uh, I think there's even time within your own specific cycles that you can say, you know what, like I'm going to try to develop this feature as fast as possible, but also clean it up, uh, make it better. So, um, cool. Well, come talk to me afterwards if you got any more questions. But thank you guys.